verse 14. Okay, so remember Cain, he already murdered his brother Abel. And what did the Lord deal with Cain? The text reads here, this is Cain whining at verse 14. Behold, so basically, look, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. Look, Lord, you drove me away today from out of the out of this uh, out of this civilization, out of this world, out of this earth. So notice that he's speaking from the emotions here. It's metaphorical. And notice, and from thy face shall I be hid. So he's basically saying that, Lord, you've uh, hid me away from your face. You just annihilated me out of existence from this earth. I mean, that's what you've done. So when he means by this is pretty interesting. He mentions that he is driven from this day from the earth and he's going out his own way. And as he's going out to his own way in life, he describes it as, from thy face shall I be hid. Now, did you notice that there? Okay, what does that mean? From thy face shall I be hid. Well, there are a few things that we could probably consider about uh, his face being hid. But the most interesting one is go to uh, Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Now, remember that passage that I gave to you in Matthew chapter uh, 25? What did I mention to you in Matthew chapter 25? Cain was cursed, right? Now, because he's cursed, notice what the Lord worded to Cain out of his sin against the Lord. If you look at Matthew chapter 25, notice what the Word of God reads concerning about those who are cursed and cast into the lake of fire. He mentions at verse 41, verse 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, compare the wording, which is similar in Matthew chapter 7. Go to Matthew chapter 7. Notice the wording here, what he says to the cursed, those who are damned for hell. And remember, Cain is cursed. When Cain gets cursed, notice what the Lord uh, words it to him. He's the damned for hell right now. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Notice what God says, the same wording to those people who are damned for hell. He says at verse 23, verse 23, And then will I profess unto them, what did he says here? What does he say here? I never knew you. So notice that Cain, remember, he was cursed and he was hidden. Being cursed and then he's not known by the Lord. So he's hidden from the face of God. Wow. So then, you know that passage where David said, If I make my bed in hell, behold what? No. Thou art there. I cannot hide from you. Yeah. But then in Cain's case, in the lost people's case, when they're cast into hell, the Lord says they're hidden. He doesn't know them. So what does that mean? This is something very important to understand about the omni, uh, omnipresence and the omniscience of God. God, He is all-knowing and He is everywhere. Even if you're in hell and lost in the abyss, God can still find you and God can still know you. However, because God, He has a free choice Himself, He can choose to hide Himself if He so desires. He can choose to not know you if He so desires. Oh, that means God is stupid. No, God, he, that means that He can do whatever He wants. Amen. I mean, don't you think that God is powerful enough to make sure that He's not going to recognize or even know the person if He wants to? It's His choice. Let Him do what He wants to do. Now, these are very interesting passages. Look at Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Notice that the Lord, He does hide things. Matthew chapter 13. No, it's a parable about the kingdom of heaven, how it's worded as. The Bible says here that he hid a certain item, and then when it was pretty much found, then he came rejoicing. And the man who uh, hid it and then found it is obviously referring to God himself. So look at Matthew 
chapter 13, verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto the treasure hid in a field. See that? It's hidden. The which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth, and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. So notice that the Lord, uh, he's representing himself here in this parable. He chose to hide the item, but also to buy the item. Now remember, all of us were cursed like Cain. We were hidden from God like Cain. And then the Lord bought us. Amen. And Matthew 13, right? Let's look at math, uh, Psalms chapter 13. Psalms chapter 13. There are plenty of verses to look at. Psalms chapter 13. And then we'll read verse 1. Psalms chapter 13. And then we'll read verse 1. Notice that God can choose to do this. It's not that because God is stupid. It's because God can choose to do it if He wants to. Psalms chapter 13 and verse 1. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? And notice that the Lord hid his face from Cain. Let's also look at Psalms chapter 135 verse 4. Psalms chapter 135 and verse 4. Some of you might say, wow, that's a lot of scriptures to turn to. i never done that in other churches that I went to. Well, why didn't you? You know what, you know what your pastor's been doing? They've been uh, pulling up the scripture on a TV screen for you because you're a TV generation. And uh, you don't know where the books of your Bible are. So then you have to study yourself. So what you're going to notice in this church is that uh, we make sure that you know the Bible. We make sure that you study the Bible. We make sure you learn. We're not going to be the type of churches that leave you in the dark and in ignorance and you just follow me whatever I say and then as long as I touch certain words that appeals to your emotions, then uh, that's the kind of church you're going to be in. No, you're not going to get in this church. You're going to get the truth and nothing but the truth and you're going to investigate yourself out of your independent choice and not be a dependent, uh, gullible person just always listening all the time. You're going to be an independent person making uh, the decision and the studying yourself. So uh, look at the scriptures, all right? Search the scriptures. Psalms chapter 135, verse 4, the word of God reads, uh, For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel. Notice, for his what? Peculiar treasure. So that matches with Matthew what? 13. What did he do with the uh, kingdom of heaven, the Bible says? He hid it. And then he bought it. And you're going to see the references where it can relate to Israel several times. The last one is Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah 57. So we see that God does it with his people. And then two cases which I've discussed is the Jews and then the other one is the church. Psalms chapter, um, excuse me, Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57, we'll look at verse 17. Isaiah 57, 17. Notice the Bible says, For the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth, and smote him. I, notice what, hid me, and was wroth, and he went on forwardly in the way of his heart. So you can notice here, when it comes to the issue of sin, that things can be hidden. That a person can choose to hide himself. Alright, we're going to return to Genesis chapter 4, please. Genesis chapter 4. So this is what the Lord did with Cain. Now here's the interesting doctrine here. The Bible says, when Cain says, I'm going to be away out of existence from the earth, and I'm going to be hid from your face. So we can see here there's a lot of uh, metaphorical expression. But when you look behind that metaphorical expression, people don't say metaphorical expressions without some sort of intention inside the heart. Why did he say that I'm driven from you? That I'm away, driven off from the face of the earth, like I'm away from existence. Because basically there's a group of people that he's disappearing from existence. That connects to God too. God and this group of people, he's being disappeared from them. Because, notice the wording again, and I mentioned to you in our last Genesis study, look at the latter part of verse 14, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. Now what does that mean? Uh, a fugitive and a vagabond. So he's wandering. He has no place to settle in. So he's away from his settlement at home, which is pretty obvious, that's Adam and Eve, but it's more so than that, it's a fugitive. So, in other words, he's away from established law. So he's a criminal now. 
and he's oh, wandering away from, for his life here. He's an outlaw. Wait, then it's a little bit larger than that. What is this? This includes the Lord here. He's breaking God's law. We saw at verse 12, which is pretty obvious, where the Lord uh, pronounced a curse upon Cain. Because why? He broke his law. So, there was something that he broke here. So, he's away from a certain establishment. And this becomes even more so when you keep, read it, when you keep reading at the next part of verse 14. And it shall come to pass. So, Cain is whining here. It's going to happen later on, Lord, that everyone... See that wording? So, it shows an establishment, a group of people. That findeth me shall slay me. So, he's arguing here that there's a whole bunch of people that you've cast me out. I became a fugitive to them. I become an outlaw in your uh, establishment and kingdom, God. I'm hid from your face. And these people can look, it says, findeth me. So these people can go out and try to search for him to kill him. Why? To get vengeance concerning Abel. So it shows there's already, so to speak, it's indicating a lot here. There's a lot of indications here that there's already an establishment here. So, we already know, Adam and Eve, that they've been cast out of the Garden of Eden. And we can see here that this would be their establishment, their domain that they've settled in. But the Lord's connecting himself over here as well. Like this is my territory. Why? Because let's think common sense. We know from common sense the Lord had his establishment with man over here, right? He communed. He talked with him. They were living happily in man's establishment and the Lord was in charge of this. Is that correct? All right. When Adam and Eve moved over here, the Lord never left them. The Lord continued their, His communication with them. Now, I know that in the Garden of Eden, like a direct communication, a direct connection with the Lord, that's definitely out of the picture. Why? Because sin separated them. But notice that the Lord didn't totally separate Himself from them. You might say, why? Because He was talking to Cain and Abel at Genesis 4. See, so the Lord... He was with them, and he was still communicating with them. This becomes very plain when you look at Abraham, who's away from the Garden of Eden, but he's starting an establishment where the Lord's starting a new establishment, a new group of people through Abraham, and the Lord's still communicating with him. Now, for some of you who don't know, this is the doctrine which we call the Kingdom of Heaven. The Kingdom of Heaven. Now, what is the kingdom of heaven? The kingdom of heaven is a physical, earthly kingdom that the Lord God establishes. Now, if you read throughout your Bible, there is no doubt that the Lord had an earthly kingdom and His own group of people on the earth throughout the Old Testament. We saw this at the beginning of Genesis 1, right? God says to Adam, I'm going to give you dominion over the earth, that then, that's an earthly rule and establishment. He repeats it again with Noah, Genesis chapter 9, that you're going to rule, take over the earth, etc. So it's an earthly establishment Noah had. He did it with uh, Abraham. Why? Because the whole earth is corrupt and the Lord's not going to drown it out again. And God says, hey Abraham, I'm going to start a new group of people with you. My kingdom is going to be established uh, through your people. An earthly kingdom. And then we notice that the Jews, they lost their earthly kingdom. Why? Because of the Babylonians. They lost their earthly kingdom. The Lord forsook them. But then he gave them a chance through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But you know what the Jews did? They rejected him. So then the Lord turned to who? He gave the Jews another chance again through the apostles. But the Jews kept rejecting him. So then they turned to who? The Gentiles. And with the Gentiles, it's not a physical earthly kingdom. It's a spiritual kingdom called the kingdom of God. And then with the kingdom of God, 
we can see that there's a difference with a spiritual kingdom and an earthly physical kingdom. So right now what we are is we are in the spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God. That's why the church is not found in a building, bless God. I mean, you would have freaked out last year then, right? You would have lost your salvation, right? Oh, I'm a Catholic. I need to catch up my confession with my priest. I'm gonna, I need my church again. No, you don't need that. We're a spiritual kingdom. So because of that, we don't have to worry about church buildings or whatnot. So understanding that, we, uh, the, the Lord temporarily cast off the Jews and turned to the Gentiles. And now what, what it's called is the church. If a Jew is going to join the Gentiles, guess what? They're going to join the Gentiles program with the spiritual kingdom, the church. So that's what happened. The Jewish people, the Lord, uh, he temporarily cast them off. But if you know your Bible, he's going to establish an earthly kingdom in the future, right? Yeah, and guess who's a group of people he's going to restore? The Jews again. Because that was his promise about an earthly, secular kingdom that he's going to establish. You notice today's churches, they're trying to establish an earthly, secular kingdom. Mm -hmm. But you notice that the Lord, uh, he doesn't bring a blessing or peace to that. It's a spiritual kingdom. Earthly kingdoms are all the devil's territory right now. You, you're not going to get a perfect earthly kingdom until the King of Kings comes down and reestablishes Jerusalem. So that's what we're waiting for. Now, understanding that... Uh, so this is just common sense then. The Lord during Genesis had an earthly kingdom and His own establishment. And He had His people established. So that's common sense. Now I'm going to give you verses about proving the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God. Okay, first of all, let's go to Matthew 13. Uh, Matthew 11, excuse me, Matthew 11. And then your second one is Romans 14. I'm going to show you two verses. Romans 14 and Matthew 11. Now I can go on and on and on about the doctrine of the kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God uh, through memory, but I'm not going to do that with you because uh, we have to resume with our Genesis studies. If you want to, I just only gave you a brief uh, summary of it. If you want to uh, study more thoroughly and be convinced about this doctrine, then just simply look up our YouTube video, Kingdom of Heaven versus the Kingdom of God. Yeah. All right? If you search for that video uh, under my name, then you should be able to see me teaching that thoroughly. All right, I've given you a biblical summary, which should be convincing enough if you know your Bible. And then I'm going to give you two verses to prove it. That will be enough. Look at Matthew chapter 11. Notice what Jesus says at verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of what? Heaven. All right, let's assume this kingdom of heaven is talking about, it's talking about all the way up in heaven, a heavenly kingdom. It's not a kingdom on earth. No. The kingdom of heaven what? Suffereth violence. And the what? Violent take it by force. Notice here that it shows that there are violent people who can try to take away God's earthly kingdom. Well, that would not refer to heaven. And that certainly does not refer to our salvation, the Christians where we're living under the spiritual kingdom. This makes more sense. This is referring to God's earthly territory here. And guess what? That did happen. The Babylonians took it away by force and Israel lost their earthly kingdom. Uh, the devil has always done that throughout history. There's no violence in a perfect heaven, obviously. But there's plenty on earth. There's plenty of world wars, right? right. Hitler tried to do that. Napoleon tried to do that. War after war after war. Right. The Catholic Church, by the way, tried to do that. And the Muslims tried to do that too. Why? Because they confused the kingdom of heaven with the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God, Romans 14. Romans 14. Romans chapter 14. Paul is speaking to the church at verse 18. Notice at verse 18. For he that in these things serveth Christ, see that? So that's definitely a saved Christian from the church, is acceptable to God and approved of men. Speaking to Christians, what does he say at verse 17? For the what? Kingdom of God is not, notice here, meat and drink. It's not physical substance. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's plainly spiritual. Go back to Genesis 4. Genesis 4. Remember Matthew 13? God hid what? The kingdom of heaven. Remember that? And Cain said what? About the kingdom of heaven. He is hid from it. How about that? That's interesting, isn't it? Is it not? 
Cain is cast out of the God's kingdom of heaven. And the Bible says that the kingdom of heaven in that Matthew 13, he can hide it. Guess what happened to Cain? God hid Cain from the kingdom of heaven. All right, Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. So establishing that doctrine now about... So God has a physical earthly establishment that he did with Adam and Eve. But we can see it's, uh, it's not going to be limited to Adam and Eve because it's this fugitive... And then not only that, it says at verse 14, everyone that findeth me. This sounds like a larger group of people, a larger establishment. Did you recall the teaching that I gave to you? God's establishment is not just here. It's also over where? Here. Why? These are two establishments of the Lord. The garden was still there. So there are two establishments. So then, Adam and Eve's here, and then who's here, right? Well, I've talk, taught to you before, and I'm not going to explain it again, that it was very possible that Adam and Eve had other children before the fall. And if that's the possibility, then it would make sense they were here, Adam and Eve were here, and see, Cain is cast off from God's kingdom. So he's completely away from here. So he's being pushed more this direction. All right, so understanding uh, those pointers, which is very interesting, uh, another possibility is this, is that let's assume, because I said this is theoretical, right, that there's uh, children that Adam and Eve had before the fall. If it's not referring to them, then the other possibility would be referring to the sons of God. Sons of God. So then if we establish that the other group of people here could be sons of God, which is what? It's referring to those angels. Which is very interesting, who's also called uh, sons of God, if we're going to follow uh, Luke 4, concerning about Adam's unfallen state. People who are in unfallen state, then they're known as sons of God, right? I've showed you that in Luke 4. If Adam and Eve had children before the fall in their unfallen state, they could be what? Sons of God too. So that's interesting. But the second possibility, what I mean by sons of God, is angels. That's what I mean. So this is the second possibility because angels were roaming around the earth and so uh, God, he was driving out Cain. And then he was afraid that these angels might get a hold of him and God knows what kind of horrible things they can do, right? Why? Because Cain is outside of God's divine protection now. So then the devil, or his fallen angels, they could do all kinds of horrible things to Cain, perhaps. So then, that's what the Lord does out of mercy at verse 15 here. So out of mercy at verse 15, And the Lord said unto him, so the Lord is speaking to Cain, because Cain is so worried and fearful, this is what's going to happen to me, and what if all these people try to kill me? The Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain... So God says out of mercy to Cain, If anyone's going to try to slay you or kill you, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. God says that my vengeance on the person who tries to kill you will be seven times more. Now you notice here that God was not unfair to Cain, as I've showed you at the beginning of Genesis 4. If God rejected Cain's sacrifice, it was for a very good reason. Notice that out of God's mercy, even though the Lord punished Cain, he said, I'm going to avenge you, and guess what? I'm going to do it seven times more. Vengeance to whoever kills you. Wow! How about that? So even that shows here if Adam is so much in grief and he wants to get even with Cain, that the Lord says, then I'm going to take vengeance sevenfold. Now that's a lot of mercy. And grace. So then, you have to understand here that God gave Cain every chance in the world. You got to realize that Cain, after verse 15, he had every chance in the world. He had uh, hundreds of years. What was going on? You're going to find out later on that Cain's family descendants and his civilization, they're totally in apostasy and they're in quite a good imitation of today. Remember what I've told you about this, uh, Cain's civilization and his religion? All the way at Genesis 4, it's repeated today. 
And you're going to see that as proof with his descendants, imitating your pattern. Imitating your pattern. Now notice here, how is the Lord going to protect Cain? The Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So the Lord said, I'm going to put a mark on you. Otherwise, anyone who tries to find you, uh, they're going to try to kill you. So I'm going to make this mark plain. So now comes the deep doctrine here, the interesting do doctrine. What is this... Uh, let me find a good marker, this one. What is this mark of Cain? So the mark of Cain can be in three possibilities here. Now, we see this as something negative, obviously. That's what you're going to hear quite often. The mark of Cain is something negative and bad. But actually, possibility one, it's not really as bad as you think. You might say, why? Isn't he cursed? Yeah, he got cursed by the Lord. But the mark is not the curse. The mark is the protection. If you look at uh, verse 15, God says, when I put a mark on you, it's your protection. See that? So yes, he got cursed, but the curse is at verse 11 through 14. Verse 15, that's not the curse. That's, that's his protection. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, possibility one. Because who's the one who put the mark on Cain? God. God. Did you notice throughout your Bible when God puts a mark on somebody? That's usually a positive reference. Okay. What is this mark? It's protection. Correct? The mark is protection here. From what? Getting killed. Hurt. From harm. Right. Okay, he's being protected from harm here. Okay, if he's being protected from harm, look at all the scriptural passages about God putting a mark. And if that matches the definition. Go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 9. Ezekiel 9. Ezekiel chapter 9. We're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 9. We're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 9, and then we'll read verse 6. Uh, no, let's start off verse 4. Verse 4. Notice that the Lord puts a mark upon these people. But He puts the mark, notice, on their forehead. You notice that? Okay. Now look at this. Ezekiel chapter 9. We'll read verse 4. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a what? Mark. Mark. Upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Now, notice verse 6. Why did he put the mark on them? He says here, Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man to, upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Now you notice that here? The Lord put a mark upon the people at Ezekiel 9. Why? To protect them from His judgment of killing all sorts of the unbelievers out there. You notice that? And it's repeated again in Revelation 7. Look at this. Uh, or Revelation 9. Revelation 9. It's repeated again at Revelation 9. Revelation chapter 9. Now, notice that the Bible says at verse 4 and 5, 4 and 5, in the tribulation, what does God do to the people who do not have His mark, God's mark? Verse 4, And it was commanded them they, they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which, what? Have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. So notice that harm happens upon the unbelievers who do not have God's mark on their foreheads. And notice that these are referring to devils. At verse 3, right? So these devils know when they see God's mark on them that, hey, I should not harm them. If Cain was afraid of what? These guys? The fallen angels. When God put that mark on Cain, then they know, oh, we shouldn't touch this guy. How about that? Wow. 
Now, here's another question. Another question is, well, uh, I find it hard to believe that a person who's of the devil, that the Lord can, uh, or whose demon possessed the Lord, can put his anointing on them. Wait a minute. Who was Saul known as? The Lord's anointed. Would you say that this guy was such a saved, great Christian, or he was full of the devil? He was full of the devil. He was demon-possessed, man. The Bible plainly said the evil spirit came upon Saul. See, so that is very possible. Now, possibility two, which is very understandable. It's very understandable that, you know, I kind of find it hard to swallow on this one. Because why? Satan, he was of that wicked one. We already know that. Yeah. And then Cain, he's definitely a person that went to hell. That's plainly found in the scriptures. So I don't see this mark more as a good thing. I can see that more as connected to a bad thing. And a lot of people connect the mark of Cain to the Antichrist. So is there a possibility to that one? Actually, there's a lot of interesting verses on this. Go to Jude. Jude. So possibility two. Possibility two. It could refer to the Antichrist. Cain is actually a picture or a type of the Antichrist. So then what are one of the types of the Antichrist that Cain went through? A lot of people use his mark. And there is some scriptural indications for this. Let's first look at Jude and then go to Revelation 13. Jude and Revelation 13. Scriptures is very, very enlightening here. Scripture with scripture. Let's look at Revelation 13 and Jude 1. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 13, and we're going to look at Jude 1. Now, the Bible says here, when we look at Revelation 13, the mark of the beast, right, which is pretty plain. Uh, we see here, uh, where does it say uh, mark of the beast? Okay, we'll start off at verse 17. 17. And that no man... Uh, might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, right? We look at verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hands or in their forehead. forehead. So notice here, a mark in the forehead, same thing that God does. But this is a bad mark. This is the Antichrist mark at verse 18. 18 talks about 666. So this is the Antichrist mark. Now, uh, it's the mark of the what? Beast, right? Alright, so if it's the mark of the beast, you have to think about, okay, he says beast. What is the beast here? Look at Revelation 13 and verse 2. two. And the beast which I saw was like unto a what? Leopard. Leopard. The, uh, the small body parts are other animals. But overall, his whole body is a what at verse 2? Leper. Okay. Simple question. Mark of a leopard. Is that correct in Scripture? Yeah. What is the leopard's mark if you notice it? It's, it's a spot. Look at Jude. Jude. Notice what the Bible says. Now, uh, before I continue on, Jude is uh, what kind of epistle? It's a tribulation epistle, right? right? I'm not going to argue for that, all right? This is just going to waste so much time. So I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to go at uh, taking that into account. We're going to go to Jude 1. And then look at verse 11. These unbelievers, listen, look at this. These unbelievers are known as what at verse 11? Woe unto them, for they have gone in the what? Way of Cain. These unbelievers who are on the Antichrist side, they're known as the, the followers, and they're going by the pattern of Cain. And notice what the Bible says at verse 23. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment, what? Spotted by the flesh. They get spotted. How about that? Why? Because it's so simple. They got the mark of the leopard here. Spot. 
How about that? Scripture with Scripture shows you a lot of things. So it is very possible Cain could be tied to the Antichrist mark. But now here's the question. Go to Revelation 13 again. The question is this, but it doesn't make sense. The Bible says God put the mark on Cain. It never said that the devil put the mark on Cain or the Antichrist, right? So then here's the question. Well, look at the wording here. That's the thing. Look at the wording here. If you notice the wording here, when the Antichrist put the mark on the people, that power, okay, let's uh, go one by one here. The power, the authority, right? If you look at Matthew, it's even more plain. It'll say power and authority, which is very interesting. But anyway, I'm not going to get into that, all right? <laughs> but power and authority. Now, the beast, he gets the authority to put the mark on people. He has the power to put the mark on people, but that's not of his own. It was given to him. Look at Revelation chapter 13. And then you'll notice at verse, let's see, 7. And it was given unto him, see, uh, the Antichrist, to make war with the saints, and to what? Overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. So notice here that the Antichrist, he receives the power that was given to him. Now some might argue that this is referring to the devil giving the Antichrist power. But who's the one who gives the devil the power? God. Look at Luke 4. This is in, look at the wording here. Yeah, the Antichrist gets to rule over all the earth, the kingdoms of the earth, but that was given to him, the power. Sure, the devil's the one who's uh, ruling over all the kingdoms of the earth, but he says that this power was given to me. Why? Because the Lord gave him that power. Look at the book of Luke, chapter 4. And verse 6, verse 6. Notice the wording in your King James Bible. Luke 4, 6. And the devil said unto him, Jesus, all this what? Power, which is referring to what? The kingdoms at verse 5. See, all the kingdoms of the world. So verse 6 says, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is what? Delivered, delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will I give it. See, God delivered it to him. But then the devil says that, you know, I can give it away to anybody that I want to. How about that? Why? Because the Lord gave the devil that power. So then when the Lord puts the mark on Cain, this doesn't have to cause the confusion. Well, I thought if we're going to connect that to the Antichrist mark, that doesn't make sense. No, when the Antichrist has the power to put the mark onto somebody, you got to realize this. He is fulfilling the power of God through Scripture. God says this is what's going to happen in the future. How about that? You know why? We, uh, we believe in the sovereignty of God. We believe God is all-powerful. We're a little bit more Calvinist than some of you uh, Calvinists don't think, you know? We believe that the Lord, that He is all-powerful, that He's in control no matter what free choice you make. See, we're a little bit more Calvinist than the Calvinists. You notice that there? We don't believe God is so weak that, oh, I can't control anything when people are running in their free will, so I have to make them a robot. No, the Lord's not that weak. All right, let's go to Genesis 4. All right, I'm not doing apologetics on Calvinism. All right, let's go to Genesis 4. Genesis chapter 4. So notice that the Cain, he receives the mark, which is the black spot. So he receives a black spot. If you notice throughout history, in history, there were people who always dreaded the black spot, right? They would say, or they, when they put a mark on you, they would say, a mark on you, it would be that black spot. Now notice here, which is pretty interesting, is that remember the leopard, he has the mark, right, himself, and that's all over his body. The Bible talks about a Jew spotted by the flesh, so, which shows here that in Cain's case, it could be where that blackness of the mark could spread all over him as well when we compare that with Revelation 13 because at Genesis 4, 15, 
It says, and the Lord set a mark upon Cain, but when he puts that mark, it has to be plainly seen. So then a person can't just assassinate Cain. They can't, uh, they can't murder him. They have to plainly see him as he is so that they can say, oh, the Lord put a protection on him. It says here, the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any, what? Finding him should kill him. The latter part of verse 14, that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. So it may be possible that the Lord has to make it so plain so that the people can't just accidentally kill him, right? So then, sometimes if uh, Cain can't just do all the time, hey, look at right here, right here, you know, sometimes he can't do that, especially people, when they want to kill you, they usually try to do it behind, right? So then, it is very possible that the Lord could have put that black spot on Cain where it's spread all over so that people can plainly see it. But again, these are three possibilities, and you can connect that to Jude and Revelation where the leopard had that all over his body, but we don't know. These are all possibilities. Let's look at verse 16 now. Verse 16. So those are some of the interesting doctrines concerning about Cain, actually. Those are some interesting doctrines concerning about Cain. By the way, uh, you can make a spiritual sermon out of this. I don't have time to do this, but um, in the hymns that you sing and the sermons that you preach, we always talk about that uh, we're covered by the blackness of our sins, but then we're whiter than snow because of what? The blood of the Lamb. Amen! And there's a song that, Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. <laughs> and then you'll talk, uh, Are you washing the blood of the Lamb? A lot of the hymns talking about being spotted. But then the Lord, He just paid us uh, clean by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Okay, now we're going to look at verse 16. Verse 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. So notice that Cain, he was driven out uh, from God's presence. And he dwelt, the Bible says, in the land of Nod. So if he was uh, driven to the land of Nod... Notice the direction, which is not a surprise. He dwelt in the land of Nod, driven out from the Lord, on the what? East of Eden. <laughs> Remember what God did with Adam and Eve? Yeah, they drove driv them out. Uh, verse, chapter 3, verse 24. Uh, what did he do? He driven them out toward the east direction. So where, where is Cain going again? Which is a bad direction. What's the direction again? East. Yes. So it's going west to east again. It's going west to east again. So that's a bad direction as you will notice throughout your Bible. It's a bad direction. West to east. Understanding this is west to east that the Lord drove him out from the what? Notice the wording. Presence of the Lord. Which shows what again? This is the Lord's territory here. His presence. His establishment. And Cain is being kicked out of the kingdom of heaven so to speak. He is driven from God's civilization and presence. That's why it makes so much sense. Cain started his own establishment, civilization, technology, religion. Why? Because it was good enough for me at the sacrifice when I did it in front of the Lord. My one world religion. My one world civilization. Or did you forget that in the previous Genesis studies? And God don't like it. And God cursed me for that. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to overcome the curse and then do it my way. And he builds his own civilization. Isn't that today's world? Yep. Today's world. The Lord curses them for their one world ideology, their religion, their belief, their civilization. Like Cain's sacrifice. And when the Lord doesn't bless them... And they get offended and mad and the Lord curses them and He sure pronounced judgment. You know what uh, mankind does? We shall overcome. <laughs> Build back better. You see that? Oh, I don't care, you know, that, uh, that I was uh, born into this kind of body. This is wrong and I don't care if the Lord puts a judgment and I reap what I sow. I can transform my body into something else. With the power of science, we can overcome these issues. How do, we, how do we allow fornication to run in free? We have the science where 
you don't have to worry about spreading disease or you know getting somebody else pregnant hey all right am I preaching at someone here okay Genesis 4 and then we're gonna look at verse 17 and Cain knew his wife and she conceived so Cain uh, he got to know sexually his own wife and she brought forth the child. So then now here comes the question, obviously, is where did he get his wife from? Because remember this. Remember, Abel and Cain were the first people on the earth. All right? There's no other people besides them. And the wording is uh, plainly shown, as I've shown you, at Genesis chapter uh, 5, when we read uh, verse uh, 3, 4, and 5. So when you look at those passages, it shows here Adam and Eve that when they had children, the first ones were Cain and Abel. And then the third one is Seth. And then after Seth, that's when it started to multiply. That's the reason why, uh, we, that's the reason why I mentioned here that during Cain and, Cain's outcast, there was no other uh, children that Adam and Eve had after the fall. It's only them after the fall. So then the other group of people, you can only think two possibilities. It's the angels or it's other children they had before the fall in the garden. So that's the explanation to that. Uh, returning back to the text here. So then w we can guess at verse 17, then Cain's going to have to pick up his wife later, right? So he's going to have to pick up his wife later when Adam and Eve start to reproduce into more children. So when they reproduce more children, then uh, Cain, he eventually uh, married uh, one of the people within Adam's family line. Now, uh, I got to cover the liberal argument here. Oh my, is time already flew? Okay, let me cover the liberal argument. And then Cain's civilization and technology, I can't cover that today. We'll cover that next Sunday. Um, but we'll see. I'll see if I can squeeze time. Uh, the argument here by the liberals is notice that the Bible promotes incest. See, the Bible, you know, it's got such a problem, you know, that brothers were marrying sisters, and this is such a bad problem, so your Bible promotes incest. And then Christians go, oh, oh, yeah. So I can't really criticize Muhammad then for trying to marry a nine-year-old or something like that, right? Oh, by the way, that's the truth, okay? I'm not just saying that, all right? You've got to study your history. But it's a given point by the liberals, like, so then the Lord allowed incest. So then how are we supposed to deal with that? Okay, there are several explanations to this, which is pretty simple. Uh, okay, let's go over here. I'm going to have to erase part of the cliff here. All right. One, let's give a scientific explanation. Scientific explanation. Because the liberals love science, right? And then uh, the argument, obviously, is that, well, scientifically, you know, uh, concerning about reproducing within the family, it's not as healthy. Uh, why? Because within our genealogy, uh, mankind is deteriorating, actually. So that's why they try to evolve and try to overcome it. So then they mention here that scientifically it's not ideal. So the simple answer to that is... During that time, if you read Genesis chapter 5, it wasn't that scientifically harmful. It was actually scientifically beneficial. You might say, why is it scientifically beneficial? The reason why it's scientifically beneficial is because at Genesis chapter 5, notice that they were uh, living up to 900 years. So because of that, there is no concern about within the family affecting genealogy here with deterioration. Why? Because despite of the fall, they still had a much healthy system uh, before Noah's flood. Secondly, why it's scientifically beneficial is because you don't want your population to die out. Yeah, as uh, mankind, you want to make sure that you flourish and you survive. So for, science, uh, for the name of science and the good of humanity, like you liberals boast about, and that's the reason why the family had to reproduce. So, if we're going to argue science here, that's one thing. Second thing, morals, all right? There is no moral violation here. Now, you might say, no, there is quite a moral violation here. No, it's not, because the simple answer to that is this, is that when you look at, even the liberals will agree with this. Let's go with the liberal argument here. 
Uh, you believe that morals, that they, they're relative, right? Oh yeah, they're relative, you know. So then, Christians agree that there are some parts in the culture that would be rude, disrespectful, and immoral, and other cultures that there's not a big deal out of that, that it's okay. So then, we, can agree, uh, we agree that there are some parts where to some Christians it's considered sin. Other Christians, they have a free conscience about it. Uh, Romans 14 is a great example of that, right? If you violate your conscience and you're sinning, I don't know if you knew that. God plainly calls it sin. So let that be a lesson to you before you gamble and take risks. Well, the Bible never said it's sin, but well, if you violate your conscience, it's a sin. Okay, But to other people who have a free conscience about it at Romans 14, and I mean a free conscience about it, it's not a sin. So see over here in the morals here that the Lord understands that some things can be relative. But obviously there are morals that are absolute as well. Murder is murder. There's no happy way to go around it. And not even an atheist or a diehard liberal will go around that. I don't know how they do that. Okay, So there are some morals, even the die-hard liberal will have to admit that. That there are some things that are absolute and then other things that we can say is relative. Well, if the liberals want to argue that way, it's so simple. Cain and Abel's time, Adam and Eve, they never thought about, oh, we're committing incest here and this is a big problem and, you know, this is very immoral. No, you got to realize this. They were the, the, their thinking that time was not like different families and within relations. They're only thinking we're the only humans on earth and it's just common sense that we reproduce and spread out. So to them, it was not immoral. Why? Because the time period and the culture and the thinking of the conscience level that time was very different from us today. It's that simple. Today we have too many people roaming around and differences of family. We're not, uh, we, uh, we're not related. In Adam's case, it was common sense. We're all related here. And so in order for us to survive, we have to reproduce. Us, we would think that this is uh, immoral. Why? Because we already have differences of family and we already have so many people running around. And it's just weird that you would just marry your sister after that. All right? That's just immoral right there. Secondly, secondly, you got to realize this. The one who, when you argue for morals here about conscience, where do those morals come from? You know what liberals argue? They have to argue a fantasy level. They have to say, oh, I just feel it, you know, and stuff like that. See, then they're good just going by abstract emotions. Their emotions can be undependable. Right. How do they know uh, who sets the standards of morals? That proves the existence of God. You know why we believe that there is a God? Because there has to be a lawgiver. For every laws on morals, there has to be a lawgiver. God's the one. Yes. Mankind, definitely not. So God's the one that can allow things to happen and not allow things to happen. I mean, uh, we can see that in the New Testament that the Lord didn't want the elders of the church where they go through polygamous relationships as well as the Christian church in general going through polygamy. But didn't, in the Old Testament, didn't He have polygamy running around? See that? So see, the Lord, He allows some things to happen, not allow things to happen. Didn't the Lord say that they should be stoned to death if they take God's name in vain? But then today, what did the Lord say? You know, you're supposed to repent and forgive the brethren. Show grace. Right? See, so the Lord, He sets the morals. He sets the morals. What we deem to be immoral or cruel or something weird, during a different time period, different group of people, they didn't think that way. And by the way, okay, if you're so judgmental about these people's culture in the past, why shouldn't they judge your culture today? You know what they think about your agenda, liberal agenda today, your culture? your cultural norms today, that you're disgusting. All right, let's go to Genesis 4. How about that? All right, I mean, look, I'm not being mean. If you said that what they did was disgusting back then, what, isn't it fair that that culture that time thought of you guys disgusting too on what you're doing? Yeah. All right, enough preaching. Genesis 4. And we're done, actually. I have to stop here. So, uh... Now Cain's civilization begins. He builded a city. We will talk about his technology, his civilization, 
his uh, one world kingdom and possibility about these guys just catching up. What was going on in the land of Nod? All right, there was something satanic. It's not a good thing what you're going to see here in the scripture. Right, right. It's all connected to something bad. Let's close with a word of prayer. God, my Father, I pray that today's Genesis study was a blessing to the hearers, that increased our knowledge of the scriptures, that, uh, we're be, that we've been able to uh, see more truth behind your word and see your pattern, your dealing, and your working, and your operation of things. And I pray that we will not follow the way of Cain. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.